things like that. So uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that. I look forward to, to that. And make sure you pray for one another. Don't think that everybody's, everything's going well for everybody. Always remember everybody's going through something, whether they voice it or not. Amen. Did he shave you? Is that what happened? Did he, was he mad or? Was he upset with you and he shaved you? Or? So then he shaved you. Did he hold you down for that? Or I mean, because when you walked in, I was like, who's this guy? I didn't even know who he was. I just shook his hand like, who is this guy right here? You do look younger. You don't look 30. Amen. Maybe maybe they can get you a discount. <laughs> that is a blessing. Hospitals and airports. And the military. Hospital airports and no military. What's that? And FEMA buses. Don't get on the bus. If anything you ever remember, trust Jesus and don't get on the bus. All right? Just remember that. Never go, <laughs> never go to a second location. <laughs> never. Right? Nothing good happens at a second location. Right? Never. Anyway. Acts chapter 18. Or is it 19? I might forget here. Let's see. Nope, it's 18. All right. Right? Never go to a second location, right? That's right. I did go on the Baptist tour bus. I got on that bus. I always get in trouble on those buses. I make all the fundamentalists mad at me on those buses. And then there's like a split in the bus, like half of the bus <laughs> likes me and half of the bus doesn't like me. And Look how intently he's looking at me. I wish everybody looked at me like that. Yeah. That's a, what's that? He did keep me in check. I was good on that trip. I had to be good because you were all with me, so I had to make an effort of it, right, Ryan? I had to take a stab at it, didn't I, Ryan? What's that? I had too many witnesses. Acts chapter 18, verse number 6. You know, we covered a lot of the things before then and a, a little bit of this, but the opposition and the blasphemy and then the clearness of conscience that Paul had all those things are kind of important to the text here uh, in understanding what Paul was going through and why he shook his raiment and he did what he did, what that exactly meant. We didn't really get to that last week, but we'll, we'll work on that here this week. And when they opposed themselves, that's one, they opposed themselves. Number two, it says here, and blasphemed. So there's... There's a level here, and you're going to see this as we go through this, that first they opposed themselves, and then they blasphemed. He shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Let Father in heaven, Lord, we pray you bless us now as we look at the scriptures here tonight and help us to understand them and help us to learn from them and to grow thereby. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Number one, they oppose themselves. That's what happens. That's what sinners do. When a man fights against the gospel, he opposes himself. Because God, if peradventure of God, would give them repentance unto life, right? But they oppose themselves, the good that could happen to them. When the Jews fought against the truth, they put themselves in a terrible place of judgment. When people fight against the gospel, when they fight against the gospel truth, they put themselves in a terrible place. Acts 13.44, a similar situation that we read about earlier. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. 
But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. So here we see that the Jews were always against those that didn't get saved, were always opposing, they were always blaspheming God. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it, far, put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now, the same thing happened here. Some people would say that that was a dispensational change. It wasn't. Paul just said, hey, you won't listen. You're, now you're blaspheming God and you know who the God of the Bible is. And because you're blaspheming God and because you're doing that, well, I'm done with you. We've given you all the truth that we can give you, and you won't receive it, and you won't accept it. Paul was constantly dealing with the Jews, trying to get them to see their need for Christ. He had a love for them. In Romans 10, 1, he expressed that. He said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. They had a zeal. They do. Even those Old Testament Jews today, those that are, are the real Orthodox ones, they have a zeal. They have the zeal of God. They have it. But not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. See, this is a sinner's, this is the sinner's plight, right? They being ignorant of God's righteousness, they go about to establish their own righteousness. And they've not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. Once you see yourself as a hell-bound lost sinner, what do you do? What you do when you see yourself a hell-bound sinner, you then submit to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You see that you have no righteousness in you. There is nothing good in you. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. You see that there is no righteousness, there's no goodness in you. God brings you to that place to show you that. He brings you to that place of a lost condition. See, the Jews hadn't seen that. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. The only righteousness that can save you is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There isn't any in you and I. It's all filthy rags. They oppose themselves, though. That's why the Bible warns us that the attitude we are to have with men that oppose themselves. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 23. The general rule is this. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. Listen, sometimes there's a... There's a there's a dissension here that takes place if you're not careful. If you, if you entertain foolish and unlearned questions from people on the street, if you entertain them in people when you're gospel witnessing to them even, if you entertain foolish and unlearned questions that gender strifes, that they're not about the, gospel, the law and the gospel and their need for the Savior, if you entertain foolish and unlearned questions, it's going to gender strife. It just does. It builds it up. It makes things worse. Right? And the servant of the Lord must not strive. That's the goal. The, that's, the, that's the general rule. That the servant of the Lord doesn't live his life in, in needless strife. Do you understand that? That's what he's talking about here. When you're dealing with sinners, I don't needlessly strive against them or strive with them in a needless way. Or I don't entertain their foolish and unlearned questions. Because it, all it's going to do is make you mad. Because you know it's foolish. So Paul says the general rule is to not do that. Is to not, not, is, is the general rule is to not strive like that. But be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. That's, that's our desire. Our desire is to be apt to teach and to be patient with them, right? That's, that's what God wants us to be. And, and by the way, this is, a lot of this is primarily in the pastoral epistles. It's dealing with the pastor's office. It's dealing with how he deals with sinners, how he deals with uh, saints, how he deals in the congregation with people and such. That is, that's his goal. Is to be, that's one of the qualifications of a bishop is apt to teach, right? So it's part of who he is. 
to be patient, and that'll always be tested. Always. When you pastor people, the one thing that you'll realize is your patience will always be tested. Always. Always. It, 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 that's just the way that it is. And it's, it's above, a, a, above the average testing of things, I should say, in that sense. And I don't mean that to say it in an exalting manner. It's just truth. That's why Paul said it. <laughs> you got to be patient. He's got because people want to test your patience. They want to poke you. They want to instigate you. They want to make you mad. They want to flare you up. They they want to do that. And sinners when they're and saints when they don't want to get right with God, they they really want to find an excuse that they don't have to be right with God. So they can look at you and they can say something about you so then they can get away with not being right with God. Oh. <laughs> tricky in meekness the bible says instructing those that oppose themselves there's that phrase again oppose themselves right those men opposed themselves and in meekness we're to do all we can to instruct those that oppose themselves boy that's not easy that's not an easy task if you know somebody's making a wrong decision <laughs> and you're trying to instruct them in meekness and to not get angry, not to get upset. It's like dealing with your children. You know, you, you, yeah, you can fire off the handle at them at, at everything, or you can get angry, and you can raise your voice, and you can get really excited all the time, and that can be your general reaction, but that's not going to produce the desired effect. The one thing that we have to try to do is to deal in meekness, right? And when people want to make decisions that you believe are bad for them, you in meekness have to have to love them and you have to care for them and and that's a challenge instructing those that oppose themselves if god peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth that's your goal in anything when you deal with people is that, that you want them to repent that you know that will help cool your passions if you always remember that your duty in reproving and rebuking people is not to breathe fire on them it's not, I'm right, you're wrong, and that's the way it is. That isn't the goal. Your goal for rebuking and reproving anybody is to bring them back into a state of rightness with God. You want them to get right. You don't want them to stay wrong so you can browbeat them about it, right? I, my goal is for them to get right. My goal is not to push them away, to make them angry or to make them upset. My goal and my desire is for them to get right. So that's why meekness has to be used because the end goal must always be kept in mind and that is to help them to recover, right? That's our goal. We want them to recover. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. That meekness means a softness of temper, mildness, gentleness, forbearance under injuries and provocations. Injuries, mildness, and, uh, mildness under injuries and provocations, into being provoked. Forbearance under injuries, forbearing to lash out, forbearing to bring the hammer down, so to speak. Forbearing to, uh, you know, react in a way that's going to be uh, unbiblical, right? That's the challenge that, that we all face with these things that God wants us to be meek. It's a softness of temper. In an evangelical sense, it's humility. It's resignation, submission to the divine will without murmuring, murmuring or peevishness. It's opposed to pride, arrogance. Paul did all he could do to see them recover, but they would not listen. He in meekness instructed them in the ways of Christ. So when he came to the point that it was no longer profitable to strive with them and to instruct them, because they would blaspheme God, he walked away from them. It takes wisdom to know how long we're to strive with men. It takes wisdom to know that. It, you have to ask, that's why you and I ought to pray for wisdom. We ought to pray that God would give us wisdom to know how long to strive with somebody, how long to speak with someone, how long to deal with them in that sense, somebody that we're trying to witness to or somebody that we're trying to help, somebody that's not right, that we're trying to help get right. We have to have wisdom from God to know when that is, right? 
we have to pray about that. It's something that we have to stay in prayer about because it's easy uh, to get in the flesh when it comes to things. We he didn't get uh, you know Paul he knew when to when to stop. He he believed that he was right and he was like they're blaspheming. I'm done. You know think about this when we dealt with those charismatic people on the street we didn't get violent with them they got violent with us. They wanted to get more violent with us right, but we didn't. We didn't get violent with them. We tried to instruct them. We did come out forcefully when they blasphemed God, didn't we? Because that's what they were doing right in front of your eyes. They were blaspheming the gospel. They were blaspheming God right in front of us. Right? Some may see a contradiction here that Paul tells us in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves and to everything, but, but you have to understand something, to everything there's a season. There's a time, basically, when you're going to be straightforward and you're going to walk away. There's a season to everything. There's a general rule that in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. But if you study the life of Christ, you will see that in meekness, he would instruct those that oppose themselves. And then there were other times that he would blast them when they needed it, Right? When they blaspheme God, he would let them have it. When they blaspheme, make not my father's house a house of merchandise, right? He was angry with them for that. So there's a time that that's going to that's gonna be, that's going to take place. There's a time that, that we have to be that way. And it's not comfortable for us. We don't like it. It isn't fun. I told those kids, you think it's fun for us to come out and have to give you like the harsh, the law and and preach to you that your sinners on your way to hell and your sin, God hates it. You think it's easy for us to tell you these hard things? It's not easy for us to come out here and say these things to you. We would rather not have to in that sense, right? But we have to because they need to hear it because no one else is going to tell them and no one has told them. Now you'll see that what Paul says is they blasphemed. That's the next step. Step number two, they blaspheme. Their opposition turned to blasphemy. Many of the Jews, indeed most of them, uh, persisted in their contradiction to the gospel of Christ and would not yield to the strongest reasonings nor the most winning persuasions. They opposed themselves and blasphemed. They set themselves in battle array against the gospel. They joined hand in hand to stop the progress of it. They By the way, that's exactly what those charismatics did. They stepped in, and what did they do? They stopped the gospel preaching. They, per they perverted, and they blasphemed God. That's exactly what they did. See, that's, that's real-life stuff. That shows you that these things still happen today. Yep. And a lot of pastors don't experience this because they don't go out on right. the street. They never face, no one ever disagrees with them. Right. Do you understand most of these men in pulpits that they, no one ever disagrees with them? They never face strong disagreement like that. So they almost live in this bubble somewhat because they never face that strong opposition, right? They don't go out and war outside of the camp. So when they don't do that, they don't understand how it is. So they can watch a video. It's like one, one pastor in Florida there that told me I should quit years ago. I'm still here, praise God. And, uh, and he, but, but he said that, but he said, oh, I don't like that type of evangelism. I know, because you're afraid to do it. How do you like that? You're afraid to do it. You're afraid to make full proof of your ministry, aren't you? You're afraid to go out and be an evangelist. I think you done quit already, friend. How about that? You wanted me to quit, but I think you already quit. Because you ain't making full proof of your ministry. You're not willing to go out there and stand outside of the camp and bear the reproach. I'm going to tell you what. It ain't as hard to sit in the amen section in the church house and preach the word of God. But when you get out on that street and you bear that reproach out there and you lift the name of Christ up, people hate your guts for it. And they war against you because they war against the gospel. They don't like it. And that's why a lot of Christians don't like it. They lose their luster for it. They lose their guts for it. They lose that, that fortitude for it. It's easy to do. I've had people leave this church because they couldn't handle the street preaching ministry. They couldn't handle that evangelism. They didn't like it. 
It bothered him. Put him on spot. Oh, that's your pastor? You bet it is. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. And you know what? Somebody needs to make some noise. Somebody needs to make some, because all the queers out there are making it. All the transgenders are making it. And how's it all working out for you, huh? They're bold. They're brassy. They're in your face. They're mocking God. So Paul went right to him, didn't he? He went to right where the sinners were, and he preached the gospel to them. And they blasphemed, no surprise. To justify their infidelity, they broke out into downright blasphemy, said Matthew Henry. John Gill said this, and when they opposed themselves to the truth and contradicted themselves in many instances. Why did he say that? Because here you are Jews, right? And you're supposed to believe, you have the oracles of God, you're supposed to believe the Bible, and you're rejecting the Messiah that came to you. You're rejecting, and you're also blaspheming God. By the way, which proves that Jesus is God. Because if you blaspheme Jesus, you're blaspheming God. Amen. Amen. That's what proves that Jesus is God as well. They opposed the truth. They contradicted it themselves in many instances. And their own prophecies, or those books which they themselves allowed to be the oracles of God, and blasphemed both Christ and the apostle and the apostles and the doctrine in which he taught, and railed at him, and spoke evil of him, and used him in a very contemptuous and reproachful manner, as they were used from contradicting to go to blaspheming. That's why Paul says, that he finished. Now, what he was finished with them. He was done with them. Now, let's, you know, it's interesting. A few weeks ago, I was, I think it was last week or the week before that, I've been in the book of Mark 7. And I have about a ton of outlines in Mark 7 from my own personal devotions. But I, but I want you to turn to Leviticus chapter 24. We're going to talk about blasphemy a little bit. I, I didn't know that I was going to use it here, but the Lord did. So he brought it all together here. But we're going to, we're going to look at that what blasphemy is a little bit get a good understanding of that right from the scriptures leviticus chapter 24 and verse number 16 oops that's 25 there we go and he that blasphemeth the name of the lord he shall surely be put to death and all the congregation shall certainly stone him as well the stranger, as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, shall be put to death. Praise God for grace. <laughs> right? Praise God for his grace. Blasphemy in the Old Testament was a death sentence in Israel. By the way, that's a good thing for you to say to lost sinners out there when they blaspheme God. You say, you know what, you ought to thank God for Jesus Christ coming and dying on the cross for your sins because your blasphemy would have been a death sentence. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Be careful where you use that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, some of those things, people twist your words, you know. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they do, don't they? We've learned that the hard way, haven't we, Brother Paul? They're always twisting things, aren't they? David's sin, or believers sinning, gives occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. You know, when David sinned, that's one of the things that God punished him so greatly for with his sin. He chastened him. You want to know why? Because he says, thou hast caused the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. You and I have to be careful. It's not just lost sinners that blaspheme God. You and I, if we live a wicked life, if we live outside of, of, of the sonship, of the way that we should as a son of Jesus Christ, as a son of God, uh, that, that was uh, saved by the grace of God, we, our lives can blaspheme. It'll cause the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. They'll look and they'll blaspheme God's holy name and they'll mock it and say, a lot of good that did. You know what? People do that all the time. When I was down, when we were down uh, um, at the state fair, this girl that was abused by this Catholic priest, uh, you know, we tried to reach her for a half an hour, 45 minutes, and, and uh, I came to the end of the discussion and said a few things and learned, and, you know, I could see the hardness of her and how everything was just, like, bouncing off of her, like she had some satanic force field on that everything you said to her was just, like, 
bouncing off of her. You know, and, and I told the guys, I said, we're not going to get anywhere with her. And then finally at the end, she told me why. She says, well, I, Dave said to her, you know, when you're alone, you're probably very depressed and very and and have thoughts of suicide and things of that. And she said, I do. That's why I that's why I smoke pot. And I said, and, and I said, you do. And she said, yeah, I have a prescription for it. I said, what do you need that for? She said, because of some priest that took advantage of me. Now, everything that she said to us was blasphemous against the God of heaven. You want to know why? Because that man's sin, even though he's not even a Christian, but he claimed to know, the, know Jesus Christ, blasphemed, caused the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, right? To repro you know what that word means? It means to, re uh, to reproach God, to speak, to speak of God in terms of impious irreverence, to revile or speak reproachfully of God or the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, right? The charge was so serious that one could be falsely accused of it, like Naboth was, and his vineyard was stole, when Jezebel was the real blasphemer. That's how witches work, though, by the way. Just remember that. Hezekiah's enemies came to blaspheme God, right? They spoke reproachfully of God. Ah, oh, you're not going to trust that God, are you? He's not going to deliver you. So they, they spoke blasphemous, reproachfully against God, right? And then Hezekiah prayed and God answered that. You know what? When, that's one thing that you and I should do when men blaspheme God. We ought to pray and ask God uh, to, de to, to defend his name, right? When men blaspheme God. We ought to pray and ask God to defend his heritage and to defend his name because men are blaspheming him. God hears that, right? He'll hear that more than you getting offended by somebody offending you. Who cares if somebody offends us? If they speak reproachfully against God, God will deal with them. God will deal with those people that do that. God does not overlook blasphemy. He does not. God hears it. 2 Kings chapter 19, turn there. You'll see that, that God hears blasphemy. Second Kings 19. Verse 6. And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. And you don't mess with God's name. I'll tell you that right now. You don't mess with his book and you don't mess with his name. Amen. You mess with either one of those things and you will get dealt with. God will not overlook that. You that have the truth of this King James Bible and you know it, if you turn away from that truth, it's blasphemy. You'll blaspheme the God of the Bible. You'll blaspheme his word and his name and God will not forget it. God hears blasphemy. He hears it when people speak it. They think they get away with it, but they don't. Like Hezekiah, we should pray that God would behold the blasphemy and work a mighty work and show forth his power. How long shall they reproach, Lord? How long shall they blaspheme? Psalm 74. David talked about that. Verse number 10. O God, how long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? Why withdrawest thou thy hand, even thy right hand? Pluck it out of thy bosom. For God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces. The heads. Not one head, the heads, right? And gave us him to be meat for the people inhabiting the wilderness. About there, we don't have time to talk about. Thou didst cleave the fountain and the flood. Thou driedest up mighty waters. The day is thine, the night also is thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. 
Thou hast made summer and winter. Remember this, that the enemy hath reproached, O Lord, and that the foolish people have blasphemed thy name. God doesn't forget that. He remembers it. Amen. God keeps a record. Turn to Isaiah chapter 65. Keeps a record of that blasphemy. Isaiah 65, verse number 7. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. Whew. That's not very pleasant, is it? God hears that blasphemy. He hears what they say. The Bible talks of blasphemy in the Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12, 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. You know, it's interesting. I, I heard a sermon years ago, God's Three Deadlines by J. Harold Smith. Have you heard that? Oh, that's a powerful sermon. I believe those are good illustrations of that blasphemy in the Holy Ghost. I don't believe a saved person can do that. I believe it's a lost person that does that, and I believe they don't care, but their judgment comes, and, and God is done with them. And tonight, if you're not saved, is a good night to get saved. Amen. It's a good night to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's a good night to turn, repent, and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. For God hath commanded all men everywhere to repent. Now, I believe that's the final rejection of the Holy Spirit. I think that's what Saul did. I believe that's what Saul did. He turned to a witch and he rejected the word of the Lord. He turned to wit witches. He turned. To, he wanted to find uh, something uh, spiritual, right? He wanted to go through a devil to get it. And God said, you're done. God rejected him. Why? Because he rejected God. You know, men get, you wonder about reprobate. You wonder about uh, this sin of blasphemy and the Holy Ghost and all this. Make no mistake about it. If you reject God, He'll reject you, right? He'll reject you. That final rejection of God is what took place with, with, uh, with Saul and with others in the Bible. They, they, they rejected God, and God rejected them. It wasn't, they're not going to be able to lay a blame to God and say, well, God, I didn't have a chance. No, if you're under the sound of the gospel, you always have a chance, right? You always have a chance when you have the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you ask God to reveal his dear son, I promise you he will. Why? Because I can promise that upon the scriptures. Because he will. If you ask for Jesus to reveal himself to you, oh my, will he. Just ask him to reveal your sin to you first. And then when he reveals your sin, to show you your just reward for your sin. And that's death. And then to show you that and to show you the hell that is to come for your sin, and then beg him to show you Christ. And there isn't a man that can ever say that Jesus Christ never did that for him, because he will do it for you. He will. He'll show you. He'll make himself known to you. Right? He'll make himself known. And I remember uh, years ago, boy, that's been, let's see, Almost 14 years ago when Carrie got saved. I remember the week before she got saved, she was praying. I remember I preached a sermon and she had told me later that she was praying about that, that God would show her whether she was lost or not. And God would make it clear to her. And then I remember preaching a sermon Sunday morning. And if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. I don't know if you remember that sermon, Carrie. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, but that's the one that I preached the day that she came to Christ. And I'll never forget that. I'll never forget her getting saved that day and the Lord working in her heart and changing her and making her a new creature in Christ. And, and it was a blessing to see that and, 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 to, and to watch that. But you know what? She asked God to show her, and he did. 
He did. And he'll do the same for you. He'll show you. God makes, makes the way plain. Amen. He always makes the way plain. Satan makes it confusing. That's why a lot of people that are truly saved people, they doubt their salvation and things like that. Many times they doubt it. The reason they doubt it is because they're, they're being confused. But God makes it simple. If you trust Christ, he saves your soul. If you repent and believe the gospel, he says you're saved by the grace of God, that he has forgiven your sin. He works that into you, and he shows you, and he leaves you evidence of that. But when you're so focused on you and your fear, you never get past that. You have to look to Jesus always. Every day, until you go home, you have to look to Jesus. Every day. Or I should say you get to look to Jesus. But you ought to look to Jesus more and more. Amen? But that's blasphemy. Uh, by the way, you know, uh, the New Testament talks about that. talks about blasphemy. Uh, let's see. Titus chapter 2. I think it's interesting that the Bible tells us of this, you know, um, and Paul speaks in very straight language here. This ought to make everyone, when it comes to the role of the sexes, when it comes to the patriarchy, right, when it comes to understanding those things, this, this verse right here should just absolutely make any man shake and quake and and any woman well almost like a quaker brother paul it should it should it should it should make them right and not the guy on the oatmeal i don't know if he was a real quaker but he does make good oatmeal that guy i do like his oatmeal what's that yeah it's good stuff but this ought to make him think more than anything else about that, I would think, in that sense. To be discreet, they, they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So, in other words, if you're a Christian lady, a wife, and you, you're a wife, and you, you ought to be concerned with whether your life is, is causing blasphemy or not, right? That the word of God be not blasphemed. Do you see how the Bible says that our lives can blaspheme the word of God? If you're not in that correct order, if some of you young ladies grow up and you decide to get married and if we fathers don't marry you off correctly, which is our responsibility. By the way, I, I'm always running out of time, it seems like. But, but uh, maybe I talk too much. That's the way it is, right, when you preach. You just, but if you, I'm thinking about tomorrow talking about this young lady that was killed in Yellowstone. And important lessons on the patriarchy from that right there that you can see. Because much, most of that, all of that could have been avoided. All of that could have been avoided. Right. Listen, you will save yourself a lot of heartache and pain and parents. You will if you if you settle it in your heart that you are not going to marry your daughters off to anyone that is that is going to blaspheme the word of God, cause them to blaspheme the word of God. What does that mean? That means that if this man is going to send your daughter out to go work, to fend for herself and to make a living for herself, then he, it is blaspheming the word of God. And I want every one of you ladies in here and men to understand that I am not, by God's grace, budging on that doctrine. I am not. And it matters not to me if you decide to walk away because of that. Now, I love you and I don't want you to do that. But if you do that, that's not my fault. I will shake the dust off of my garments, off of my feet, and I will say, I have obeyed the Lord. And I will have a clear conscience in telling you that if that man wants to stick a ring on your finger, he ought to be man enough to take care of you. 
And if he's not, he's a little boy that needs to stay in mommy's house. And if you are not lady enough to keep a home and to love your husband and to love your children and not be some career chasing Jezebel, then guess what? You shouldn't get married either. How about that? Is that too straightforward? Man, I hope that I hope that lays my position out very clearly scripturally. Because God already said it right here. I just want to hear all the fakes argue with me about it. God said it. He said it blasphemes his word. Now, where's your defense for it? Nothing. It's always the slimy this thing and the, and the backward stab you in the fifth rib attacks. But it's never straightforward. Why? Because they got no argument. And that's why our churches, this very doctrine right here is why our churches, we see in America, they are going straight to hell. They are the most, all, the children are being raised so backwards, they don't even know their parents. You see, the, these children are a lot like the world's children today in, in, in our churches today. Not in this one, because we believe God's word. And thank God for his grace to show us that that he put it into our hearts to show us that years ago that we would stick to that. But I've seen a lot of Baptist churches, and guess what they do? They blaspheme God's word. They don't care about order. They don't care. And pastors, they don't want to preach it. They don't. Why? Well, because their wives are working to fund their ministry. I, I, every pastor I was around, nearly every pastor that I was around, that I grew up around, had their wife working to fund their ministry. And I'm going to tell you what. If that has to happen here, it ain't happening here. These two hands, I'll start making tents or vacuums, whichever. <laughs> but one, one of the two. <laughs> but because I because my wife's not going to fund the ministry. I've seen it. I'm telling you, I've, I've watched it happen. Their wives have a job out somewhere else to get insurance because they need insurance. So they, so they do that so, so they have insurance through a plan of some other thing. Well, there's Christian health care ministry. Use my name. I'll get a discount. Um, anyway. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> right? But, uh, but, <laughs> but you can get by with that. You can get by with that. Work for me. All my medical bills were paid for. Amen? All of them were paid for. God took care of all of them. He'll take care of you, too. You know what? If people and their families, they don't want, they, they're, if you compromise, I, I promise you, listen to me very closely, young people, because you're going to come up to the, and I'm preaching to the future, I realize, and that's what I'm here for. See, I'm here to preach the future until God takes me home. I'm going to be that ornery old man that doesn't change by God's grace, that is still thundering that out. And Luke, you'll have to turn the mic up when I get older. But, you, you know, I'll, still thundering that out and still telling you the same thing until they stick me in a box. Right? Because you need to have that old man that doesn't move and doesn't change and just, just stays firm unto the end and says, this is, this is the way God said it and this is the way we're going to do it. If any of you children, you young ladies, if any of you or you young men decide to leave God's order and you're willing to compromise for a man or a woman, then you are blaspheming God's word. And you will live with that. And it will not be pretty. I'm warning you, it will not. Because to whom much is given, much shall be required. Him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It will be sin and you will. And don't think I won't warn you because I will. I will point my bony finger at you and I will warn you that you're making the greatest mistake of your life because you're deciding to overlook biblical principles to, for your flesh. Amen. And I am going to be that nosy pastor that makes you mad, that's going to make you uncomfortable, that's going to tell you that I think you're making a big mistake. Yeah, come on. I will. Why? Because I do, I, I'll tell you, I don't even have time to tell you why, because I'm, I'm almost out of time. I'm, I'm almost, I have it here, but I'm almost out of time. I, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and I'm going to give an account. You see, and you don't, you don't scare me. God scares me. Amen. Your ugly looks and your bad faces and your disappointments and your, and all, that doesn't, that doesn't bother me. 
What bothers me is having to stand before Almighty God naked and open and exposed to him and say, God, I, didn't, I just didn't want to tell him. I felt so uncomfortable about telling them the truth about this. I just, I wanted them to like me. Well, preacher, you're not that likable, so get over it. I, I wanted them to like me. I wanted them to invite me to their wedding. I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to get to go. Nobody ever invites me. I mean, but, but it's like, I'm going to be invited anyway. <laughs> right? But I, I, I have to stand before God. Paul knew that. Paul knew that, and it bothered him. It bothered him that he, because he knew that he was going to stand before God. So he shook his raiment at them when they blasphemed God. And he warned them, and he said, look, I'm free from your blood. I warned you. I told you. And you know what? Parents, you, and, we, you as a parent, as a pastor, I have to. We have to understand that once we've warned them and we've told them and we've done all that we can, we are free. Now, it doesn't mean it feels good to us. Paul's heart's desire and burden for Israel is that they might be saved. It, never, it doesn't lessen the sorrow, does it, parents? When you see your children go wayward, when you see them not do right, when you see them walk into sin, when you see them be that way. And by the way, that can be... Look, let me tell you something. I've baptized children. I've baptized children that years later have threatened to beat me up. Do you understand that? I'm only I'm saying that I you know why I'm saying that to you not to throw it up I'm saying that so you take heed lest you fall if you ever decide that you're not going to obey scripture I'll be your worst enemy now I not because of me because of you I'll still be the same guy that I always was do you understand that by God's grace he has kept me and oh praise God he has kept me I'm telling you, I know it. I know it so much more every day of my life. As I stand here, I'm telling you, I know it. God kept me through all of it. Amen. I couldn't have kept myself. There ain't no way. I didn't even finish my outline. But listen, here's the thing. I know that that can happen. I know that if you turn on God, you'll hate my guts. You, you will. That doesn't mean I'll stop loving you. I don't hate that kid that told me he was going to beat me up. I don't hate him. I love him. How could I not? <laughs> All I did was tell him the truth. That's the best friend a kid can have, isn't it? Somebody that will tell him the truth. Amen. Right? He'll remember that. You remember, though, you'll come back to the same place, and by God's grace, we'll still be doing the same thing we always were doing. That's, that's really what I want to finish my life with. I don't, if I never do anything great for God, if I never have any tremendous victories or any tremendous things that come, if it can be said of me, you know what? That man's still doing the same thing he did when he started. He's still serving God. And then I'll go home and I'll stand before God and, and, and rejoice and throw my crowns at his feet. You see, I, I have an obligation to warn people. You have an obligation. Paul was, you know what Paul was talking about? He said he was clean from them. He was talking about Ezekiel 33, verse 4. When, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. That signified that he had discharged his duty as a preacher, right? And so had delivered his own soul from their blood being required at his hands and that it rested entirely on themselves and they were answerable for all their impenitence unbelief and blasphemy from henceforth he said i will go to the gentiles in that city and preach the gospel to them and no more will i enter into the synagogue boy it wasn't too long afterwards though that crispus got saved the chief ruler of the synagogue how about that his house lined hard against the synagogue right he got to the chief ruler gets saved Uh oh what happened there looks like god blessed what paul did right Sometimes you got to let go of something so God could give you something else. That's what Paul did. Paul was speaking to those Jews there that day, and he warned them. You know, you and I, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to give an account. 
Wow, I took a lot of notes on this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. 1 Corinthians 3.11 warns us, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. What day? That day. Amen. Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Paul kept the judgment seat of Christ always in his purview. You know what? You and I have to always remember. We're going to answer to God one day. Yeah, we have eternal life, and that's the reason why we want to serve God and be faithful. That's the reason why we want to do right. We're not, we're not antinomians. We don't, we don't frustrate the grace of God. We're not, we, we don't think, oh, I got it made. I'm in, so I'm going to live like any old way I want to. No, it matters how we work. It matters how we serve God. It matters what we do. It matters what you do. God cares about what you do. And he's keeping a record of it. For one day you're going to stand and your works are going to be judged. 2 Timothy 4, 5. But watch thou in all things, he warns him. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul's getting ready to lose his head. Right? What does he say? His dying, fighting manifesto. I love it. It's awesome. Spurgeon wrote a good thing about that. He preached, I think he preached it right before the last ministerial association meeting that he did before he died. And he preached it to them. It was called uh, the manifesto. What was that? Do you remember what that was called? Say, say it again. Yeah, the greatest fight in the world. He was talking about this. And he said, for I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That's it, friend, right there. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. That's all of us. Amen? What does he warn us of? 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul says, man, I, I, look, I look at myself first. And put myself in subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ as much as I can. And I strive for the mastery. Because I know I'm going to stand before God one day. And I'm going to be judged. Listen, children, you have to understand one thing. And, and I, I, I'm going to speak for myself by the grace of God. And always preface that by saying that. But I'm also, I think, speaking for your parents in that sense as well. That if you fall away or if you walk away, we're going to still go for the Lord. We're not going to give up because you do, if you do. Do you understand that? I want you to understand that. We intend to do the same thing. If you break our hearts and you hurt us and you walk away from God and you hurt the, the Lord and you walk away like that, don't expect us to follow you. And you parents, you better get your love in order right now. What do I mean by that? It's idolatry for you and I to love our children, our spouses, or anybody else above God. We have a duty to God, and it's a duty to follow him above all else. If our children blaspheme God and walk away, God's still God, and he hasn't changed one bit. And I still owe everything to him. I owe my whole existence to him, and so do you. And you have no right to choose your children over God. And I'll warn you of that now. You have no right, and I have no right to choose my children over God. 
God is the one that saved me, sent his son to die on the cross for my sins and was buried and rose again from the dead. He took my hell so I could have heaven. And if you think I'm going to walk away from him because of my feelings for you, you got another thing coming. I love you, but I love you enough to obey God and to follow him. You better get that straight. You better get that love straight. And mamas, you better get that love straight too. And you better instruct your children like Charles Spurgeon's mother looked at his, him and said to him, Son, I'm gonna have, I don't want to have to witness against you on the day of judgment when God throws you into hell, but I certainly will. That's what his mother said to him. He didn't get saved until he was 16. But his mom looked at him and said, I will witness against you. Do you understand that? Why? Because we've been saved by the grace of God. We know what God's done. We know the greatness of God, the goodness of God in the land of the living. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He is good. I'm telling you what, there's no life out there. This world can't offer you anything but hell. That's all it offers you. It'll defile your mind. It'll make you filthy and rotten. It'll make you live with regrets for the rest of your life. You'll have images in your head that you would rather erase that you'll never be able to erase. If you walk away from God knowing the truth, that's the way it'll be. And you'll hate it for the rest of your life. Oh, yeah, God forgives. But let me tell you something. There's a price for sin in this life. Now, the penalty for sin is paid on Calvary for all that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But the sorrow for that sin you'll bear. You'll bear it the rest of your life. Father, Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the fire that you still give, Lord, and the grace that you give and the strength that you give and the mercy that you give and the provision. Lord, save lost sinners. If there be one or two or ten here, Lord, whoever it is that has never trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior, may they do so today. Lord, your people, strengthen them. Strengthen your children, Lord. Those that are saved by grace, those that have trusted you, Lord, they've put their trust in you. Strengthen them, Lord. Sometimes they can be shaken by circumstances and fear can arise and challenges and trials come in life and they shake us up, Lord. Help us to trust you. Help us to trust in the rock that cannot be moved. Help us to trust in the one that never changes. Thank you, Jesus, for being the same yesterday, today, forever. Hallelujah and praise your name. Amen.